Good morning. I know it might be a personal problem, but I've been in a bad mood. My wife could tell you it's true. I've been in a bad mood for about two or three weeks. And she begged me not to take it out on the students this morning, but I don't think I'm going to listen. I think I'm going to take it out on you anyway. The, the bad mood stems, I, I think, from my own ego needs. We've been overseas for 30, 31 years now, and most of it's spent from Somalia to Mauritania, Middle East, places like Afghanistan, Pakistan. And I, I don't know what I expected God to do with us. But the world that we have served for 31 years is now worse off than it was when we went there. And I thought I was more important to the Old Testament world becoming a New Testament world than apparently that, than we have been. So I, I know that um, I'm a bit angry at the world, I'm, I might be a bit angry at God. but. I think in the midst of that, if I am honest as I can be with you, maybe we'll take away something that's very valuable with you. You see, I was raised in what could be defined the New Testament. My wife and I have gone to the heart of evil. We've been uh, in, in, uh, those believers who are practicing their faith, the nearest we can uh, figure out is that 70% of them live in environments defined by persecution. So believers who are practicing their faith, normal Christianity is persecuted for their faith. But my problem is I've become too much of a spokesman on the, for the Old Testament. I mean, when, 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 when I, we've experienced what we've experienced in Afghanistan and Somalia, it, it sounds good to me that an eye for an eye, that makes good sense. It makes good sense to me, being from rural Kentucky, it, it, it's that Old Testament darkness that's still in my heart, that if somebody comes and messes with your sisters, and without their permission and willingness, has carnal knowledge of them, you and your brothers get together and uh, uh, you, you, you take them out. That, 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 that sounds pretty good to me. Yep. <laughs> I paid him to say that, so, but I paid you to be louder. <laughs> it sounds good to me. that when they drive their airplanes into our buildings and kill our people, when they take innocence that my wife and I love and the Taliban take them and we haven't seen her for seven years, it, it, sounds, it sounds right to me that if they threaten my country, they threaten my culture, they threaten my kids and my way in life. It sounds, the Old Testament make good sense to me. Let's go and let's kill them. Every man, every woman, every child says the Old Testament, and even don't leave the donkeys alive. And part of me as a country boy says, oh no, not the donkeys. Why the donkeys? What have the donkeys done? And, and that Old Testament has such root in my heart right now. And, 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 and part of my problem is we've been overseas for 31 years and, 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 and being with the Taliban, being with Muslims, being with those who are without Christ, we see the world through lost eyes. But now I've been in America for a year and my culture is telling me to do something different to lost people than I've been doing with my wife and kids for 30-some years. And I'm, I'm mad about it. I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted about it. I, I wish you could have gone to Somalia with us for uh, almost seven or eight years. Can you imagine? It just baffles me when I look in here this morning and, and see what's sitting here to go to Somalia where there's 10 million people and only 150 believers when we got there. When we left there, forced out of there, about seven, 
uh, half years later, those 150 believers had been reduced to only four. Four! We watched an entire generation of believers hunted down as if they were an animal in the woods of Kentucky. On August the 4th, 1994, the precursor to al-Qaeda, they were called al-Itahad in Somalia, now they're called al-Shabaab, and now they've morphed together with, with uh, uh, al-Qaeda, uh, planned it out, did it intentionally. They stalked four of my best friends who were believers from Somali background on their way to try to make a living for their family, put a gun to the back of their head, blew their brains out, drugged their mutilated bodies, and hid them till until today we don't know where the believers have been buried. From 1991 until February of 2013, every funeral we had for a Somali believer was was, uh, was attempted without having the body there, without having a corpse there, without being able to, to pray over that person who had given their lives for Jesus from 1991 to 2013. Every believer who was killed, we still don't know where they've laid their bodies. And he killed four of my best friends on one day. And I had four guards that were Somalis with me, and I asked them as I walked through the rubble of Mogadishu, I said, uh, give me some space. Uh, I, I don't know how you all do your time alone with Jesus. Um, my wife has a quiet time. You probably can al already tell I have a loud time with God. Probably both of those are scriptural. And so I'm going to yell at God a little bit, didn't want my Muslim guards to hear so much, and I'm walking through the rubble. They've just killed four of my best friends in 45 minutes. We, we don't yet know that we don't have a body to say grace over. Uh, and, and I'm saying to God, uh, do you have a clue what's going on? Do, do, have, have, you, have you taken a vacation? Don't you know that in this country they are killing everyone that loves you, that honors you, that has given their life to you, and, and, and these Muslims, these radicals, these Somalis are killing everybody that loves you. And, 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 and I'm, I'm supposed to be a New Testament sharer of the gospel, but I, I put on this Old Testament prophet uh, 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 demonstration, and I said to God, it's time. It's time. These people are killing everything that you love, and it's time for you to take them out. It's time for you to wipe them off of the face of the earth. They're just taking up space. They're evil incarnate, and God, it's time to kill them because, I said to God, they're not worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit said to me immediately, neither are you. And I said to God, how dare you? How dare you? How dare you put me in the, in the same category of these Somali killers? And the Holy Spirit said, no, Ripken, you're worse. You had all this access to Jesus for 18 years of your life, and you cursed me. You lived a life that was so immoral. You did things that were, were just horrible in the kingdom of God, and you had total access to Jesus, and you walked away until I hunted you down in a factory at night when you were 18 years of age. And how dare you, Ripken, ask me to kill, to destroy, to annihilate a people group who for 2,000 years no one came to tell them about Jesus. No one gave them a choice between evil and good. No one told them that there was a better story. But I'm here now. and. And I'm, I'm not with the people that we love, both Muslim and workers who have been sent out. 
young couples that met on the mission field that we married who are now there with their children. And, and we can't give you their names or tell you where they're living. So we, we have to tell on our new Satan story because we can't publicly tell Jesus' story in this kind of environment, in this kind of world. And there I, I'm watching now, uh, we, we lived, we've lived maybe 50 miles from where uh, uh, ISIS is, uh, is taking their knives and, and cutting the heads off of innocent reporters and, 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 and people who are just there to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and, and mounting their heads on the one who's been killed body as if it was a trophy for Allah. Uh, uh, we've, we, we are working in these places uh, where ISIS is taking and groups like Boko Haram are taking women by the hundreds and the thousands and making them sex slaves and impregnating them so that they will bear Muslim children and therefore the Azidis or the uh, Arab Christians will cease to exist in, in one generation uh, 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 before Saddam Hussein was killed. probably three million plus Arab Christians as far as I can remember in, in Iraq that has been reduced to almost nothing because evil has chased them out. And you hear about ISIS and, and governments say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to wipe them out, every man, woman, and child that is doing this kind of evil. We've got to, uh, 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 to let them cease to exist on the sands of the Arab and the Muslim world. And we actually, uh, the church is actually believing that there is a political and economic the, there is a military solution to what's going on in the world. And I'm angry because of the, of the Old Testament uh, that is in my heart. And I hear the Bible say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I think that's pretty good. That sounds pretty good to me. And then here comes Jesus. And here comes Jesus. And in the midst of a country defined by a dictator, in the midst of a culture that was willing to kill hundreds, if not thousands, of babies just because God had the audacity to send his son to love those people, here comes Jesus in the midst of a Roman Empire, dictators, murders, women treated, second-class citizens at best. Here, here comes Jesus in an environment that the world today would know very, very well. And, and the church is, is joining with the government, and, and we're believing there's a political, there's a military solution to ISIS, to Iraq to Syrian refugees, to, to Al-Shabaab and the killers in Somalia. And here comes Jesus. You've heard it be said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. What? What? That's not going to sail in Kentucky. Whoa, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what do you do? Knock his teeth out. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give him your coat also. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. Give to the one who asks. And do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Here comes Jesus. And you've got the evil of the world. And what's going to be pitted against the evil that is so clear in the world are the military, political, economic forces of the, of the Western and the Arab world. But here comes Jesus. You've heard it be said Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, 
love your enemies and pray for them who persecute you. Another translation says for those who despitefully use you and spit up on you. How, how, how are you doing with that one? Where, where, where does that set in your heart today? Where do you interact with the words, love your enemies, that you may be the children of God? If you greet only your own people, if you greet, if you love, if you do hospitality with only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do this? And he says to my Old Testament heart, be perfect as God is perfect. You see, I, I'm, uh, I've got anger in my heart today. It might be sin in my heart today because I'm asking you, who in your church, who in your world, who in your life, in the accountability group, that you're in? Who is standing up in your culture today? Who is standing up in the name of Jesus to say that, that, that there is no political solution for this world and its hatred? There is no economic military solution. Who is standing up today and is broadcast across our nation and say, what, here is a godly, Christ-like, Jesus-centered, follower of Jesus, response to ISIS. Here is what Jesus is saying about Syrian refugees. Here is what Jesus is saying about, uh, about having uh, the grace enough to understand that God loves, died for on a cross for both Jews for both Arabs, for both Muslims, and for every American, especially today for those who have yet to hear and to understand. Who, 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 who is speaking that into our lives? Well, we're hearing, let's go to church because God wants you to be happy. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're hearing from our culture uh, well, let's send our young men and women and let's go kill in the name of what is right. There is a government role to play. Hear me well. There is a military role to play. Hear me well. But who is going to all of these hell holes on the planet and speaking Jesus' solution into their lives? What choice have they had? If you were raised where they were raised, and you were fed a steady diet of hate, and shame, and child abuse, and, and, and eye for an eye, and kill them every man, woman, and child, and if you grew up and you were raised generation after generation after generation in that environment, you might be wearing the uniform of ISIS today. Uh, in your school is a young lady that my wife and I love a lot. Her father's been my supervisor for years. I'll take a bullet for him. Well, maybe I'll take a rubber bullet for him. Maybe a stopper gun. Maybe that'd be more honest. Well, I fell in love with him as a man of God, that when 9-11 happened and he saw that unfold on the TV, he fell on his face before God and he cried out to God for forgiveness and says, God, will you forgive me? Will you forgive us? Because we've, we never got to 
these people's country with the gospel. We never got to their city. We never got to their village. We never broke bread with them in their home. God, can you forgive us that we never gave those who are perpetuating evil a different story, a better story, a story about Jesus and his love, and I can follow to the ends of the earth a person who will fall on his face before God crying out for the souls of those who are slapping us, beating us, and killing us. We buried a, a son in Nairobi, Kenya. He died about uh, a week after his 16th birthday of an asthma attack. And ironically, he died on Easter Sunday morning. That makes Easter very different for my family. You can imagine, I don't have to tell you how hard it was to walk through that with our other two sons and how much that my wife and I had to walk together through that. I've never seen the body of Christ show up in a more magnificent way. Our son died in March. We left Kenya and uh, were kicked out of Somalia by June. And... uh, from March to June, we never cooked a meal. The body of Christ did that for us. Students, uh, much like you, though most of them in high school, every day they flooded our house, and there'd be 15, 20 pairs of shoes in the hallway coming to our house, and our two living kids on earth, uh, their bedrooms would be filled with their friends who walked through that. It took us over a week to bury our sons because of all kinds of nonsense going on in that environment. And people are just coming to our house, and people are flooding us with love. You you know what our black, our African, our our English-speaking Kenyan church did? For the seven nights it took us to bury our son, every night they came to our house in Nairobi. Bad roads, no street lights, dangerous to be out. And every night, can can you picture this? Every night, guys and ladies, they came to our house and they prayed for us as we took our baths and went to bed. And then they sat or stood in the living room of our house and sang us to sleep for a week. And I remember holding my wife and weeping and having the peace of God just fill my heart as my church, as our church sang us to sleep in our home every night. Waking, waiting for our families to wake up in the States so that we could call them. I went to the office, got on the radio, and called uh, my chief of staff in Mogadishu, a, a Muslim friend. And I wanted to tell Hussein that uh, uh, I, I, uh, I can't come in now. Here's what's happened to our son. He knew our boys. He loved them. And he is such an extrovert, and he's always talking, and he's always waving his arms, and he's always interrupting um, uh, others. He's just such a, uh, he has such a, a lively soul in him. Uh, and, and until we met, he had never heard uh, the, the name of Jesus. And, and as I told him about our son's death, he didn't, he didn't even say sorry. He didn't say anything. He, he, he just silenced. And I thought, well, there's a problem with the communication on the shortwave radio. And so I just laid it down and, and went to do whatever else I had to do. And this was on that Easter Sunday morning, people bringing food on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, food to our house, prayers to our house, gifts to our house, money to our house, mostly love and songs and hugs and kisses and tears and laughter and joy in the moment in our house. And so when there was a knock on the door, I thought more people, more neighbors, more food, more kids from the local schools, and I opened it up, and there standing, dirty, ragged, almost starved, Uh, uh, he's just filthy, smells like a goat, is my chief of staff from Mogadishu, Somalia. And I just said to him, Hussein, where in the world did you come from? 
And with all the pride that he could muster, he stood just in front of me, inches away from me, and he said to me, I have walked all the way from Mogadishu to Nairobi, Kenya, and I have come to bury our son, Timothy. Wow. He had walked through minefields. He had ridden camels and ridden in the back of goat trucks, thus the smell. He had crawled around where clans were fighting. And this Muslim man walked, rode camels, goat trucks, came five days without food, without water. When he, when I said to him, our son has died, he laid the radio, uh, whatever that thing is, down, and he walked out of the door of his office, of our office in Mogadishu, and he started walking to Kenya five days. Five days. And he said, I've come so that we can bury our son, Timothy. He doesn't know how uncultural it was that at our son's funeral, he sits between me and my wife. I don't even get to sit with my wife at my son's funeral. Muslims sitting between us. Oh, God was having a good day. And he watches our oldest son get up and sing in honor of his son who has died in the school choir. And he listens to my wife's brother's message and he hears the gospel so clearly about what it means to actually physically die and be in Christ. And he listened to the choir sing, and he watched 20-some people come to Christ, almost 30 people at our, our, at our son's funeral. And he's just doing this all the time. He, he's just sitting between us and looking and looking, and the Spirit of God was falling in that moment, and this calloused Muslim sunburnt. Somali man of the desert inappropriately reaches over and I see him take my wife's hand and he reaches over and he takes my hand and he puts our hands together and he wraps his calloused hands around ours and he cried with us. He wept with us. He grieved with us and he experienced the resurrection with us. A few weeks later, I went back to Mogadishu for the last time, say goodbye to our 10 or 15 staff members and to this man. I was able to get him back into Somalia through the United Nations so he didn't have to walk five days back. And the hardest thing was he was in the country illegally. We had to figure out how to do that. I think my wife altered his passport or something like that. No, I better not say, <laughs> I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I'm not even going to look where she's sitting now. Is she okay? Is she grinning? All right. Uh, if, uh, well, okay. I might need to go home with some of you guys. All right. <laughs> and uh, and I, I get him out of the country, and two or three weeks later, I go there to say goodbye to the staff. And, and part of the culture was to thank the staff for sending Hussein as a representative of our staff to our son's funeral. And, and I did that culturally appropriately. And I wasn't surprised when Hussein stood up and told them all the details about his five days of travel, how thirsty, how hungry, how he had to crawl, how he walked through around minefields on the camel and the goats, and he did all of this. And then I thought, wow, this is just really good. The narrative, it's like they were there. And then I thought, oh no, you need to shut up, because he began to talk about our son's funeral. And he looked at our Muslim staff and he says, why is it, why is it that, that when we die, we don't know where we're going? Why is it that when Somalis, when Muslims die, we have to wait in paradise to see, have we been 51% good? Why is it while they were crying over their son and broken by his death, they were laughing, they were celebrating because Mama and Papa, he called us. The Ripkins knew they were broken. Their son had died, but he is with Jesus, and he is in the paradise. Why do Christians get to know where they go when they die and Muslims don't? 
I thought, oh, man, they're going to kill you. <laughs> and he went on to say, and he looked at me, why have you Christians kept Jesus to yourself? And I thought, well, the staff's going to hang him. And the entire staff looked at me, and they asked me, why have you done this? Why, if there is this truth about eternal life and this truth about being in Christ and this truth about loving your enemies and turning the other cheek, and if you've had this, why have you kept Jesus to yourself? Our brothers and sisters are persecuted all over the world. Why? They've done two things. One, they've picked up Jesus. And two, they refuse to keep him to yourself. Everywhere our military is going, our predator drones are flying. If the way I read the world right, everywhere our military sons and daughters are having to die are exactly in the places where the church has refused to go with the love of Jesus. I got to get over my anger because I went too late and I said too little. And I've got to pray that you will take Jesus to the places we have refused to go. And while culture says go and kill, you'll be willing to go and die for the kingdom of God. Please, hear the words of the Lord. It has been said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Seemingly impossible. God bless you. be seated for just a minute. We're almost done, but we're not quite finished yet because we can't just leave it there. Nick, thank you. And thank you to Jesus because it's through Jesus that we have a different message. In Nick's book, he writes that we can choose to identify with either the persecutors or with those who are in chains. And the thing that determines who you identify with is whether or not you share Jesus or you keep him to yourself. I want to challenge you today not to keep him to yourself. Don't keep him to yourself here in Lynchburg as you walk out these doors. But Acts 1-8 says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as we've heard this morning, there are still millions, some in our local community, and many to the ends of the earth that have not yet heard. As we focus on what God's doing around the world this week, we're not just talking about it and educating you in this sense so that you're aware. We want to challenge you to get involved, and there are opportunities for you to do that while you're a student here at Liberty. The Center for Global Engagement sponsors global teams every year, and these are an opportunity for you to gather together with other students from Liberty, to be on a team with faculty and staff from the university, to be mentored in the process as you prepare to go and serve, to be mentored by some of our global mentors with our different partner organizations to go and be part of what God is doing in the world, to see firsthand and to share firsthand the love of Jesus with those that have never heard. This year, Liberty is sending out 27 different teams around the world. Some are going out during Christmas break, some are going out during spring break, some are going out right after graduation at the end of the semester. This morning, I want to highlight a couple of those opportunities uh, during Christmas break. We're sending a team to East Asia to work with university students. 
You guys, this is a couple weeks of the, the social life of being at university without the homework, okay? You're gonna go, you're gonna build relationships with students, you're gonna connect with them, you're gonna drink tea, you're gonna play basketball, you're gonna play music, whatever it is that you do on campus, but to go and connect with students that have never had a chance to have the opportunity to hear. That's in East Asia. We're also seeing a team to the Middle East during this time. Again, to connect with university students. Students like you who are studying, who are seeking to learn about the world, but who likely have never heard the truth and the love of Jesus. Would you be the first one to share that with them this Christmas? We're also sending out 25 other teams throughout the year. There's maybe a map that's gonna show up on the screen with those locations. India, the Balkans, various locations in Africa, North Africa, Thailand, Bolivia, Romania, Haiti, all over the world. Some are providing clean water, some are teaching English, some are rock climbing, some are doing children's and youth camps, some are working with refugees, some are doing art and music therapy, some are doing sports, photography, education, lots of different opportunities. Lots of types of ministry and many places to go, at least one that you can connect with to be part of. I want, you, I want to challenge you to take the first step right now. A lot of times we hear a great message, we're challenged by a speaker, God speaks to our hearts, and we walk out and we go to class, and we go on with our lives just as they were before. But you can take the first step without leaving this room today. If you get out your cell phones, you can text the word SEND ME, S-E-N-D-M-E, -E, to 24502 to start that process today. That's not committing you to go on a team. That's just taking the first step to say, I want to get more information because I cannot let what I have heard this morning end at 11.01. God's challenging me to do something more. So you can text that number right now. On your way out, there's going to be Center for Global Engagement tables set up around the concourse. You can stop and get information there. They're going to be set up in DeMoss Hall this week. There's going to be an expo keto on the lawn in front of the Jerry Falwell Library this afternoon until 3 o'clock. You can stop by there to get more information. Don't let this just be a challenging message that ends with Convo. What is God calling you to do, and how is God calling you to respond? And how can you get up out of your comfort zone of this chair in this bubble to allow God to work through you? to make a difference in the nations. We have a global God, and He is working all over the world, and He is inviting you to join that. Pray with me. Jesus, we don't have the answers, and it is overwhelming to look at what is going on in the world and to know how to respond. But you are the sovereign God, and your heart is for people of all nations every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we have been blessed with the opportunity to hear of you, to know you, to have the choice to follow you, and with the choice and the freedom to share you. May we identify with those who are in chains for the sake of your gospel by choosing to speak and choosing to share and choosing to show your love to the nations. Call us out of our complacency and our comfort, and I ask that you would burn in our hearts until we take that step to follow you and to be part of what you are doing in the world, because you and you alone deserve the glory. We can't do this in our own strength, but you don't call us to. So in the power of Jesus' name, I ask that you would give us the boldness and the courage and the freedom to witness for you wherever we are, here in Lynchburg and to the ends of the earth. And it is in the power of Jesus' name that we ask that. Amen. Have a great day, Liberty. Mm -hmm.